So we come now to our third speaker today, a gentleman uh, who spent, uh, previous to his current employment, 10 years with Doc here as their senior marine mammal scientist. He's also had 15 years' experience as the head of the New Zealand delegation at the Scientific Committee of the International Whaling Commission and chaired for three years the uh, Southern Ocean Whales subcommittee of that organisation. For 20 years he's worked around the world, um, uh, principally doing uh, scientific study of marine mammals and uh, as an expert in the field has represented both the Australian and New Zealand governments at international meetings. That's in addition to the work on the uh, Whaling Commission helping with the development of national and international policy. As I say, uh, previously with Doc, currently Senior Marine Scientist for Blue Planet Marine in Australia. Would you please welcome Dr. Simon Childerhouse, sir. Thank you, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, an interesting opportunity to talk to a group that probably I don't deal with that much as a marine scientist. Um, certainly, I'm going to focus today on perhaps a much smaller aspect than uh, Rob and Craig have talked about, which is really seismic surveys and the impact and mitigation of um, those activities on marine mammals. Briefly, I'm going to cover the, the EEZ Act. Rob and Craig have given you a very good grounding and background in that and how it's come to be. Uh, talk a little bit about the offshore activities that we're seeing in our region. Describe some of the, uh, the processes involved in a seismic survey and describe some of the fauna we've, we have in our amazing EEZ. Um, delve a little bit more into some of the potential impacts we might see on marine mammals and other fauna from seismic surveys. Um, and then move on to the Code of Conduct, which is essentially the kind of regulatory framework that we now have in place for managing impacts from seismic surveys on marine mammals itself. Then kind of move on to, you know, how, do we think, how well do we think the Code has been in, in mitigating and managing activities? And then some discussion about future issues for consideration and, and then wrap up. I should add it's the second to last talk, I think, of this conference for you all, so I'll put in some nice pictures of marine mammals to try and give you something to break, you know, keep your interest. Yes. So again, just a short summary of the EEZ Act. Essentially most activities, it applies to most activities that can cause environmental effects that not previously were regulated for. Um, the purpose is to promote sustainable management of natural resources in that region. And the purpose again requires adverse environmental effects to be avoided, remedied or mitigated. And again, came into force only this year, so earlier in June. The new Act kind of is a gap-filling exercise, as, as Rob has said, very much so with those focused on those, I, those activities identified there. Um, seabed mining, petroleum exploration and extraction, energy generation, carbon capture and storage, and interesting enough, marine farming. Um, again, talking about 12 to 200 miles offshore. Um, the focus that I'm gonna take today in the area that I'm most familiar with is, is seismic surveys, essentially used for exploration of geological processes, and in specific, um, specifically in relation to that, the marine mammals um, that we have in our zone and the impacts we're likely to see. Um, and the mitigation that we, that we can undertake to, to minimise or eliminate our potential impacts. So again, just a brief, very brief introduction to seismic surveys for those of you that aren't familiar. I guess many of you will be here. Essentially, it's studies done to gather and record patterns of induced shockwave reflections, so sound, significant sound source projected into the ocean in this case to try and understand the underlying structures of geological formations, essentially to look at uh, petroleum reserves or potential sources of petroleum. Um, and offshore waters obviously run from a ship, uh, a source, a source, uh, loud acoustic source, an air gun towed behind the ship with a range of hydrophone elements to detect and pick up and interpret the reflections from the seismic source that goes down into the, uh, into the sea floor and beyond, and then interpret that by a bunch of clever geophysicists can tell you what's down there and 
what you're likely to find. So I've, I've seen lots of different statistics for how big our environment, our EEZ is, so I stuck with it being nearly 400, 4 million square kilometres, and again, it's really big. The RMA obviously covers most of the activities on land, but the area we have, as Rob pointed out, is phenomenally large, and you know the new EEZ Act has a, has a big area to cover and a lot of activities that we previously haven't perhaps given as much attention to as we should have or could have. We have a huge diversity across the marine environment, perhaps even more so than we see in our terrestrial environment. Um, there's a whole range of bathymetries, topographies, climates, um, species assemblages, you name it, we have a fantastic array of biodiversity, flora and fauna in our EEZ. And you know, we really need to protect that. It's iconic, it's uh, pretty unique, much of it, in, all, in the world. So. Again, the bit I really wanted to talk about was, was marine mammals. We have the privilege of having a lot of marine mammals in New Zealand, nearly, well, at least 56 different species occurring across the full range of the EEZ, stretching from the, the temporal, temperate or subtropical waters of the Kermadex down to the subantarctic zones. So we're pretty spectacular and pretty lucky in New Zealand to have that. Um, why, why are we focusing on marine mammals? Well, obviously that's the thing I know the most about. We know they're known to be sensitive to anthropogenic activities, and in particular, seismic surveys. So it's kind of a good place for us to start. We have some background, we have some overseas studies that we can use to try and mitigate and manage what we do. Um, they're iconic, and I think, as Craig pointed out, they have a very high public profile. It's one of the first kind of groups of animals people will think about when they start thinking about impacts on the marine environment. They're, they're very charismatic. So by using them as flagship species, it's kind of a positive way to try and get our mitigation off to a start. Um, they're also a little bit different to lots of the other fauna we have, and they require specific mitigation techniques. So while some of the other acts um, can cover some of the other species, there's some specific things we know we can do for marine mammals to mitigate our impacts. So that's why we'll sort of focus on them a little bit here. There's a lot of discussion about the potential impacts of seismic surveys on marine mammals in particular. There's three key parts of it really that have been documented in the international literature. Um, physical or physiological effects, so essentially a, um, a seismic survey generates a, a powerful um, air, well explosion underwater essentially, that generates a shock wave. Now, that shock wave has potential impacts for for anything um, interacting with it. And there have been some good evidence of both temporary and permanent uh, threshold shifts in hearing of animals, um, not just marine mammals, but marine mammals are particularly sensitive to it because um, many of them use sonar to navigate. So it's a fundamental part of how they operate in the ocean is um, being able to, to be able to hear and to hear well. Um, there's also some evidence of auditory damage and decompression sickness or disease from uh, animals responding to not just seismic surveys but other sources of loud noise in the ocean um, and coming to the surface too quickly, getting the bends in essence, which is kind of more common in, in human divers. Behavioural disruption is something that's been documented across a whole range of species in a whole lot of environments, just simply from being startled by loud noise, which people were more than familiar with, to avoiding areas where the noise is occurring, um, concurrent changes in behaviour, vocalisation patterns and, and such like. But uh, some of the more subtle effects that we're not really that sure about are indirect effects such as prey displacement. Seismic surveys could um, break up krill or plankton um, balls which could make it more challenging for marine mammals to feed. One of the, one of the potentially concerning issues about is these effects are at a large, or can be at a large scale, over tens or, or hundreds of kilometres. But the, the real dilemma we're left with when trying to understand and interpret these behavior, behavioural changes are that the responses are typically very variable. They'll change by species, they'll change by time of year, they'll change by depth of water, they'll change by your latitude. Um, so sometimes we see strong effects, sometimes we see quite 
minor or no effects. And often these are a contradictory, so it's very hard for us to put in some hard and fast rules in how to actually mitigate and where to set the bar. And taking that another step further, it's one thing to see an animal that may respond to a loud source of noise by moving away from it, but then to understand the implications of that for their long-term viability or reproductive output is a very, very challenging thing to do. There may be some short-term effects we can manage, but it's very difficult to try and assess any long-term effects. So that's kind of just give you a flavour of why we might want to start managing and mitigating these kind of things. The EEZ Act has now require, well, requires specific controls on the use of seismic surveys that have the potential to impact marine mammals. Um, there's a specific section in there that refers to marine mammals because there's been some good work done over the last few years in the development of the Code of Conduct, or the 2012 Code of Conduct, for minimising acoustic disturbance to marine mammals from seismic survey operations. It's a very descriptive title, but not a very catchy one. So we refer to it as the code. Um, because this code is now uh, included in the uh, EEZ Act, it's a, seismic surveys are a permitted activity, so they don't require marine consents as long as the applicants or the proponents comply with the code of conduct itself. Interestingly enough, the code was originally developed as a three-year uh, voluntary agreement between DOC, uh, PEPANS, the kind of petroleum representative body, and other stakeholders. Uh, but the intention was it was never legally binding over that three-year period. It was going to be a voluntary set of guidelines for people to follow, to work through, see how effective and practical it was, and then review with a view to rolling in at a later date. Um, with the inclusion in the EZ Act, it's brought that forward. So uh, it's become essentially mandatory um, two years earlier than anyone anticipated, or most people anticipated. Again, the code was originally developed by DOC under their mandate under the Marine Mammal Protection Act for protection, conservation and management of marine mammals, but it's now in force really through the EZ Act rather than the Marine Mammals Protection Act. Um, and the requirements that it detail for people op operating in the EZ are, are threefold. There's a notification and approval process, a mitigation requirements and some reporting requirements. Pretty simple, but, but pretty important. Um, three year, three month notification of intention to undertake a seismic survey. That's an important step for DOC and other regulators to start thinking about how they might manage and to understand the kind of operations that are going on. Two main components of that, uh, marine mammal uh, impact assessment, which Craig's team has been involved in development of, uh, and a marine mammal mitigation plan. Essentially, the first is a overview document about how or what processes are going to be taken to mitigate any potential effects and the second part is kind of how to operationalise those agreed mitigation strategies. Um, the MMIA is essentially a document that contains enough information so that the Director General of the Department of Conservation can understand the effects, look at the mitigation that's been proposed and determine whether that's sufficient to meet the requirements of the survey work. So it's not really an environmental impact assessment, I think, as people think of it in general. It's a much more specific document that only refers to effects on marine mammals, although there is a reference to other effects on, in the EEZ, but it's a, a very minor part of this. 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, there are also operations that occur in areas of ecological importance, which are kind of areas identified by Department of Conservation or marine mammal sanctuaries. Now these are areas of what we believe are higher sensitive, potentially higher sensitivity for seismic surveys and so DOC may require additional mitigation within those zones. And both those documents um, are approved by the Director General of Department of Conservation. So mitigation is standard in the code, which is a really good step. Uh, uh, applicants or operators know what they need to do and they it's pretty clear right from the start. If you have a level one or a level two survey, the survey level is determined by the size of the acoustic source you're using. Um, depending on the, the louder or bigger the source, the more mitigation you're required to do. But some of the standard mitigation techniques are marine mammal observers to make sure that they know what's going on out there and if any of the animals come within the zone of the uh, source, they can shut the operation down. 
Passive acoustic monitoring is also able to detect marine mammals that are underwater and vocalising, so it's another supplementary tool. And soft starts and pre-starts procedures. So before any of your sources started up, you must undertake monitoring to determine what's in the region, and then when you do start up, you start up quietly and you build up to, a, to your desired source level. And a, additional mitigation may be required, as I said before, if it's taken and undertaken in a marine mammal sanctuary or an area of ecological importance. Just briefly, the mitigation distances again are defined in the code, which is helpful. It, it, it helps us in understanding what's required prior or in the survey development. But the distances uh, in those zones vary by, by species, by whether it's got a calf or a young with it, um, and the size of the seismic source. So the larger the source, the larger the mitigation zone. And the, the exclusion zones are um, up to 1,500 metres for the larger sources. So any marine, ma any marine mammal or it's, well, any of the specific marine mammal species of concern that comes within that zone will shut down the seismic source. Reporting, there are um, requirements under the code for all sightings of marine mammals to be reported to DOC within 14 days of the survey concluding, uh, trip reports submitted to the Director General within 60 days, and some more stringent immediate reporting requirements where if their operator has evidenced if there have been any non-compliances with the code, uh, then they must be reported. There are more marine mammals seen in the area than were predicted under the Marine Mammal Impact Assessment, then that needs to be reported so that the department can consider whether they want to implement additional mitigation. And additional conditions which can vary, but simple things like highly endangered species like Maui's and Hector's dolphins can be immediately reported to DOC so they can go out and find them and look at them and perhaps do some work on them. So has the code been successful? Last year was the first year it had been in action uh, and it was only voluntary, but there was pretty good compliance from most of the operators. Some minor issues with operationalising it, trying to get it to actually work in practice, but, uh, but overall it was very good. And in fact some of those minor issues have already been reviewed and suggestions made to modify it to make it a bit more easy to use. The second season is coming up this summer um, and it's now mandatory. And again, operators are, in gener are generally positive and, and accepting of it. The code itself represents some of the best available knowledge we have for mitigating effects on marine mammals across the world uh, and does represent one of the most stringent mandatory regulatory re regimes seen anywhere in the world. Um, it does represent a considerable increase in protection for marine mammals in New Zealand, but there really is still some room for improvement, which is not unsurprising given that this was supposed to be rolling out in three years' time rather than today. 19 minutes. Thank you. So the issues behind this, there are a few issues really that we need to still think about in, in fine tuning perhaps this exercise. Silent um, science behind setting those mitigation distances is pretty hard to do. Um, we've got some reasonable information on it but we could certainly improve how we do that and those ranges could be increased or decreased depending on um, what we find. Some of the requirements under the code are that we use qualified New Zealand people to undertake the work. And there's at the moment only seven people in New Zealand qualified to operate as marine mammal observers in the region, which puts pressure on the operators to be able to meet their requirements. And passive acoustic monitoring operators, there's no qualification pathway for them at present, although there is a three-year window where they've got, they can use unqualified people. A um, couple issues that people have identified include that the the observers are employed by the contractors rather than the department or any of the other government agencies, which kind of brings in the question of the independence of their role um, and whether the, whether the self-regulatory kind of situation is, is something we might want to consider in, f in future. I think no one quite expected the, the range of feedback we would get or the, the range of operations that would be going on in the EEZ and so resourcing of DOC in particular to meet those needs and the requirements of the operators is, is increasing rapidly and there's some resourcing constraints potentially on them. So overall I think the inclusion of specific marine mammal protection in the EEZ Act reps, uh, represents a considerable step forward for New Zealand and it's a really positive thing. It represents some of the most stringent and mandatory regulations anywhere in the world. New Zealand's leading the way really with this. 
Um, it's generally been viewed as positive by operators, but it has moved from a voluntary regime to a mandatory one two years earlier than everyone was intending. So there really was, has been a little bit of um, disgruntlement, I guess, about that across a range of sectors, actually. Um, the first implementation last season was very successful, and there are already some improvements to operationalise it in a more positive way. And again, several issues that perhaps we could require, we could look at to make improvements to it. And that's me. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much indeed. Simon Gildenhouse. <laughs>